Well, it's time to get into the Word of God, so I just want to remind each one of us, every sermon that is being preached at Any Hope You See Campus is always on you version. So if you follow, if you have that Bible app, you version, you can go to li- uh, events, live events, and you can find sermon notes from all the campuses of Hope Unlimited Church. So I would request you to make use of that. It's a great tool to write your own notes and save them to your phone, and you can always look back at what you have heard. And I would tell you, it's a Great thing to write notes when you hear. Sometimes when you hear, you can forget. But when you write, you tend to retain it for a longer time. So encourage you to make use of that tool. Okay. So if you've been following me, I'm talking about a series called... Anybody? Anybody? Louder. The fight. Come on, say it. Come on, the fight. No. I love my congregation to talk back to me. I love to hear you speak, you shout out to me. So say, the fight. That's good, fight. So we've been saying that no matter who you are, the moment you receive Jesus into your life, you move from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, you're automatically drafted into, the, into this fight, okay? You became the enemy of Satan. So Satan comes and torments you, troubles you in various ways. So we are all involved in this fight. And to recap everything, week, the first time I spoke, week one, I spoke about the fight that we are involved in. This fight is invisible because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritualities and powers in darkness in the high places. So this fight is invisible. We do not fight in our own strength, and we do not fight for victory, but we fight from a place of victory. Hallelujah. We fight from a place of victory. We are not trying to be overcomers. We are already overcomers because of what Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. We are called, equipped, and empowered to win. Amen. Called, equipped, and empowered to win. We do not win because of what we do. We win because of what Christ has done for us. So we get to walk in this victory, okay? And week two, I talk about how we can enforce or walk in this victory. And Paul, when he writes about his talks about two words, he's talking about standing up. So stand firm. So stand firm. And he goes on to say, suit up. Now shout out, suit up. Suit up. And he, as he was writing this episode, he was under house arrest or in a jail, probably chained to a Roman soldier, and he begins to give a visual example what we must be wearing, what is the kind of suit that we all must have. And he starts to speak about the different kinds of armor that the Roman soldier was wearing. So the first thing that we saw was the belt of truth. The belt of truth talks about grounding ourselves in the truth of God's word. The next we saw, the breastplate of righteousness, where our righteousness does not come by our own works, but our righteousness comes from what Jesus has done for us. We can't have righteousness on our own. We have imputed righteousness. That means because of what Christ has done, and when you believe him, the Bible says you are the righteousness of God. So we wear the blessed breastplate of righteousness. And week three, I spoke about the shoes of faith. If you haven't heard it, you should go back to YouTube or the church website. You'll have all these sermons over there. The shoes of faith. Shoes talk about stability on every kind of tier terrain. If you have good shoes, you can be stable wherever you go. And it also talks about mobility, right? When you receive the word of God, when you receive peace from Christ, it is also responsibility for us to share that with others. It talks about mobility. So you should be engaging yourself in sharing whatever you receive from Christ. Then week four, I talk about the shield of faith, okay? The Bible says lift up the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the enemy, okay? I am not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm not moved by, by situations or circumstances. I'm moved by what I believe. And the shield of it talks about a belief in Christ, belief in the word of God, faith in his promises that whatever God has said, it will come to pass. The shield of faith. The way we apply shield of faith, we constantly listen to the word of God. We look, 
We lock ourselves with others in faith. That's why I spoke about the importance of being part of a life group. When your faith is locked up with someone else's faith and together we do it, there is an impregnable wall that is against the enemy. So lock yourselves with other people's faith. Look up to Jesus who is our shield. Okay, week five spoke about the helmet of salvation. Salvation. Salvation is just doesn't depend now. Salvation is in the past, present, and future. Your sins are forgiven because of what Christ has done for you. At present, you can live a victorious life, but there is a day that is coming in the future when one day we will live with him. That's the hope of our salvation. So your future is secured. So when thoughts come saying, is this right? When thoughts of discouragement, depression come into your heart, the Bible says, put on the helmet of salvation. Put on the helmet of salvation. Helmet of salvation. So if you haven't heard and missed out any of the sermons, I want to encourage you, go to YouTube. Hope you see India YouTube or the church website. You need to listen to this because we are in a fight whether you like it or not. And to win, we need to wear this armor. We need to suit up. And today I'm going to talk another important piece of the armor. Okay, another important piece of armor, okay? And this is one of the premium weaponry in our arsenal, okay? Every piece of armor is essential, but the way you use this one will determine whether you'll be successful or a failure. The way you're gonna use this will show me, also will show me whether you've been listening to me or not. Okay, it'll help you to be successful or a failure in, in our life. This is one of the very important piece of armor in any one of our lives, okay? And that piece of armor is found in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. Okay, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Let's all read it together at the count of three. Let me see who's awake. One, two, three. Salvation. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So what's the piece of armor we are looking at? The sword of the Spirit. The sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit. Now, when you talk about the sword, I have a couple of swords with me over here. All right. So whenever it's written about swords in the Bible, mostly uh, they talk about two kinds of swords, okay? Okay. Uh, one of the sword is called Ramphaya. Ramphaya, okay? Ramphaya, okay? Ramphaya is a long and broad sword. It's a long and broad sword. It's about um, 40 inches plus, longer than a yardstick. It's a great broad twist sword. Sometimes probably you need to use it two hands to wield this. Rum fire. It's a kind of sword that the Roman soldiers used in battle. But there was another kind of sword that's also mentioned. It's called Makaria. Makira. Makira. That's it. Makira. Now this word refers to a knife, more especially to a short sword carried by the Roman soldier. Now this varies from six to 18 inches anywhere. This type of sword is also used in hand-to-hand -hand combat to stab the enemy. To stab the en enemy, okay? The typical strike would be either in the abdomen, which would tear their guts out. That's how they used it, okay? Makera. And this word, this word is called, for Romans, it's called gladius. Gladius, okay? Now, some of you sword fans, if you like movies, sword fighting, I have a clip for you. Watch it. Ha <laughs> ha 
Well, you saw those two kinds of swords over there, right? One was a sword, big broad sword, where you can slash, using it so powerfully. But the shot on knife is a sword. It's a precision instrument. It's a precision instrument. You can pinpoint with accuracy where you want to head. So Paul here is talking about using something like this. And when he's talking about the sword of the spirit, he's not talking about a physical weapon over here. Because he said, he, when Paul was writing about the sword, he's not talking about some piece like this. Okay? He's talking about something spiritual. That's why he calls the sword of the spirit. It's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. And he says the sword of the spirit is nothing but the word of God. So Paul says, hey, take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now the word of God, we know the word of God is very powerful. You know, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 talks about the word of God, something like this. He says, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What Paul was talking about, not a physical sword like this, but he's talking about something that you and I have in our lives. He's talking about the word of God. He says, this word is powerful, living, active. And he says, this doesn't, didn't come through men. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says like this, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Spirit. So Paul is saying, hey, we need to be people who, are, who learn to take up and fight with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And this sword is a very powerful sword than this physical sword, because this word is living. This word is powerful. This word is inspired by God. This word is infallible. It is inerrant. It can be trusted, believed. In this are words of life. In this, it has directions for your life. In this, the Bible tells who God is. And the Bible also tells who you are in Christ Jesus. So Bible, Paul is encouraging the believers and saying, Hey, hey, take up the sword of the Spirit. Get familiar with the sword of the Spirit. Immerse yourself in the sword of the Spirit. When the enemy attacks you, this is a weapon that you can use. Not a physical sword like this, but it says this is far more powerful, far more greater than any sword that exists in the world. And he says, take up the sword of the Spirit. This word, the Bible, is a book to read, book to believe, love, share, enjoy, and trust in. It is the word of God. We must saturate ourselves with the word of God. Now, the Guinness Book of, Record, uh, book of World Records says like this. It says, although it is impossible to obtain exact figures, there is little doubt that the Bible is the world's best-selling and most widely distributed book. This was some years ago, okay? Writer James Chapman created a list of the most read books in the world based on the number of copies each book sold over the last 50 years. And he found out the Bible far outsold any other book, okay? Designer Jared Fanning put out an infographic which we can see that, and it shows why the Bible, the number of books, number of purchases of the Bible, okay? He said like this, he said 3.9 billion copies, that's about seven, eight years ago, this, this survey, okay? And quotations from the works of Mao, Setung, came in second with 820 million copies sold, and Harry Potter came in third with 400 million copies sold. You version that I've been talking about, you know, the Bible, they record, as says they have more than 450 billion downloads. This book is the most sought after book. This book surpasses every other book that ever existed on the face of this earth. Why? Because this book is powerful. This book brings life. This book is the spirit of God inside of us. So when Paul is speaking about the sword of the spirit, he's referring not to a physical sword, he's referring to the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. 
Now, when Paul was describing about the word of God, there are two prominent words that are used okay, to help us understand what this, this word means. In the original Greek language are these two words called logos and rhema. What is logos? Logos means the written word of God, which is recorded in the Bible, okay? Written word of God, okay? This word refers to something said. It also refers to the thought behind the words. This is often used to speak about the entirety of the word of God. Logos, okay? The other one is called Rhema. That's exactly what we named this baby. I don't think it's a coincidence today. I don't think it's a coincidence. I didn't know the name of the baby. Okay? So God is trying to teach you something today. Rhema. What does Rhema mean? An utterance or the spoken word. An utterance of the spoken word. When it is used of the word of God, it does not speak of the whole Bible. It speaks about a specific verse or a specific passage of scripture. Okay? So when Paul uses this word in verse 17, in Ephesians chapter verse seven, 6, verse 17, Rhema is not referring to the whole Bible, but to shorter sections of the Bible. Shorter sections of the Bible, okay? Now, I'll give you some examples of Logos and Rhema's over here. Okay, John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. That's what we call Logos, okay? Luke chapter 8, verse 11, the seed is the Word of God. Okay, examples of Rhema. Okay, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Rhema, a specific word of God. A specific word of God. Okay, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 that we are looking at. It also talks about, take the element of salvation, sword of the, which is the specific word of God. Of God, the Rhema word of God, the specific word of God. So this word of the Spirit involves applying specific scriptures or specific principles for a specific situation, for a specific task. What is Rhema? Rhema simply is this. This is Logos. The whole thing is called Logos. But sometimes you can read the Bible and something speaks to you. Suddenly something speaks to you. You read that passage hundred times. But that, Sunday, that morning, something happened. The Spirit of God brought that scripture alive. And you've been probably waiting on God for a situation and you see your situation right there. That is the rhema. And Paul says, hey, take up this rhema. Specific scriptures in your fight against the enemy. Your fight against the enemy. Think of the Bible as a vast armory. In that armory, there are weapons of every size and description. These are designed for specific types of battle. And Paul says, not general knowledge, but specific scriptures for specific purpose. And Jesus is our greatest example how to use specific scriptures in specific situations. And we're going to see what, how Jesus effectively used the scriptures in combating or foiling the plans of the enemy. We find that in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Because this was a time when Jesus was fasting. It says Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. That's natural, right? You don't eat for a meal. Some of us are hungry. And even the sight of food... Oh, even it's a billboard or even it's in a visual, not even real. You hunger for it. So Jesus was fasting and he was hungry and that's the moment the devil comes in. Often the devil will come in at your weakest moment. And you got to be on your guard. The weakest moment. So Jesus was hungry and the devil comes in and tempts him like this. Says, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell the stones, to become bread. So tempting. If you are hungry especially. And when you have the power to do it. Remember that. When you have the power to do it. Jesus had the power. He could have turned that. If he wanted to. So tempting. He was facing this situation. Okay. But look at how Jesus. 
resisted the enemy. Okay, so verse four says, Jesus answered, it is written. It is written. What is Jesus doing over here? He's speaking out a particular scripture passage. A particular scripture that was already written in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Specific scripture for a specific situation. And this is what Jesus says. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Specific word, specific situation. That's Rhema. What did Jesus do? He's taking this, he looked into the Logos and picked out a scripture that will help him in that situation. And he resists the enemy. Now the devil didn't keep quiet. He was not going to give up so easily. So he does something else. So as if go, go on. It says, then the devil took him up to the holy took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said. Who said? Who is saying this? Louder. Louder. Devil? Are you sure it's the devil? Probably some of you got a revelation this morning that the devil can speak the word of God. The devil can quote the word of God. Maybe you didn't know that. But I want you to know today, the devil can quote the word and he is quoting the scriptures over here. And this is what he's saying. He says, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he's using the same language. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. The devil is using a scripture to tempt Jesus. If he could do that with Jesus, I want you to know, he's going to use it against you. The scripture, the scripture, and he'll deceive it. That's what he did with Eve. He said, did God say like this? Beware, my friends. You got to be on your guard. You got to know how to apply the scripture well, how to understand the scripture well. So if you're not, you will fail. And the devil is using the scripture here to tempt Jesus and say, jump. And the angels will, the Bible says, angels will get hold of you. But look at what Jesus did. He could have done that. He said, I can call, on one part of Jesus said, I can call 12 legions of angels to come and help me. He has the power to do that, but he still didn't succumb to the schemes of the enemy. Verse 7, Jesus answered, said, it is also written. Picks out a specific scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16 says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Specific situation, specific scripture. The devil doesn't keep quiet. <laughs> he goes on. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. If you will bow down and worship me. Sometimes the devil comes and tempts each one of us with power. I'll give you everything that you need if you follow me. I'll give you everything you need if you can do some mischief. In your accountings, yeah, you can score off some and say, this is not there, this is not there. You can cover up, yeah? Power, you'll get a lot of money, power. Look at how Jesus resisted the enemy. But Jesus said, verse 10, go away, Satan, for the scriptures say, once again, he picks out a scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13 and says, Fear the Lord your God, serve him only. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only. And the Bible says, then the devil left him, the angels came and attended on him. Three times the devil came to tempt Jesus and three times he used a specific scripture to resist every temptation of the enemy. You know what? He was tempted in the wilderness. Sorry, he was tempted in the garden. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. And you and I are tempted in this world today. And how much more we should be people who are using the sword of the Spirit. Jesus, he knew all the scriptures. But so when, when 
the devil came, he was not fighting with a broad understanding. He was not fighting with all the, script, all the word, all the scriptures. But he, he was using specific scriptures for a specific situation that helped him to overcome the enemy. The lesson for us is clear. That's clear for us, right? We need to be familiar with, the armor, with our armory. We need to know where all the, all the different kinds of swords are placed. If you don't know, we will fail the battle. Jesus used the word of God not only for offensive purposes, but also, sorry, not only for defensive purposes, but also in an offensive way. He used the word of God to defend himself against the attacks of the enemy. But he also used the word of God to be an offensive, taking over the kingdom of darkness. So whenever Jesus spoke, he brought life, he brought transformation, he brought deliverance. He snatched people out of the kingdom of darkness. So whenever we hear the word of God speak, when one sinner repents, when you come back to Jesus, that's an offensive weapon. That's an offensive weapon. The scripture is used as an offensive weapon. When you, as your child of God, apply the principles in the word of God into your life, when you're sick, when you're poverty stricken, when you're broken, and you apply the word of God, and you see progress in your life, that's an offensive way that you use the Bible, use the word of God. The scripture needs to be spoken, used, not only defensively, but also offensively. This will allow us to take the battle to the enemy. But sadly, some of our swords are rusted. Some of your swords have been gathering dust, haven't been picked up in a while. I have a sword which is rusted a little bit. This is not going to be as effective as this one. If you look at both of these, this is rusted, but this is, which will be more powerful? And some of us, our swords are like this at the moment, rusted. And that's why you never win. That's why we face, when the enemy comes in, we don't know what to do. Sometimes when the enemy comes in, we use the whole, we try to figure out where it, where everything, what I can do. I've seen some of us <laughs> putting the Bible under their pillow and sleep. Some of the pastors, I saw some of pastors also when pray the people, the people with the Bible on their heads. How is your sword today? That's a question I want to ask you today. Is it rusted or is it shiny? Is it sharp enough? We need swords that are sharp. We need swords that are shining and sharp to thwart the enemy's attacks in our lives. So how do you keep your sword sharp? Keep your sword, how do you keep your sword sharp? Number one, get familiar with the sword. See soldiers, before they could ever use this weapon in, in a combat, they need to first know how this sword works. They should know, they, they need to know how does it feel in your hand? How tight you, how, how tight you should grip? Or how, how should you hold it? Which angle is better to use it? Which will give a thrust, enough thrust? They keep practicing to make sure in a combat situation, they know very well which, how to use this sword. The same way in our spiritual lives. We need to be familiar with the word of God. We need to be familiar with our God. Some of us are not even familiar with what's in the Bible. How many of you know there's a book called Habakkuk in the Bible? Lamentations. Some of us don't even know what's there in the Bible. Come on, it's time to get familiar with the word of God. You should know where, which, which scripture is where. How do you come to that place? How did Jesus come to that place where he could pick out scriptures? Because he knows he was familiar with the word of God. How do you do that? Read your Bible every day. Read your Bible every day. Make it a habit to spend time reading the Bible. Because this is the sword. 
This is this word. Read your Bible every day. Get, fam- get familiar with it. Know which scripture, where each scripture is. You can always find out. If you don't know how to go about it, you can always go find out online. The U version has so many Bible plans for you to read. Get familiar yourself with the word of God. Number one. Number two, meditate on the word. Meditate on this word. Now some of us, you know how we read our Bible? We speed read our Bible. Wake up in the morning. You're getting late, okay? What's the portion for today? Amen. That's not going to help you. you know, some of us are in the habit of, okay, what should I read today? Go hang yourself. It's there in the Bible, by the way. This is not going to help us. We need to be students of the word of God. We need to be diligent in our reading of the Bible. So if you don't have to read, pick out a Bible plan. Read from Genesis to Revelation if you want to. Read the New Testament if you want to. But follow a systematic and specific plan. And as you, as you read your Bible, ask the Spirit of God to illuminate scriptures for you. And when you have scriptures, you memorize it. Memorize it. That's such an important thing for us as Christians. We need to know the Bible. Memorize the Bible. How did Jesus quote the scriptures? Because he knew the scriptures very well. He was familiar. He knew the scriptures. And it is on on our parts for us also to not only familiarize ourselves, but also we need to be meditating on the word. Memorizing the word. Meditate on the word. Meditating doesn't mean read once and forget it. Meditating means think about it. Think about it. As the cow continues to chew its cud. After some time again. Chew the word of God. Pick out a scripture. Think about it. Not only in in the morning, but throughout the day. Look at the scripture. What does that scripture mean? What does the scripture teach me? Ask the spirit of God to help you. Meditate on this word. Number three. Speak the word. Not only familiarize yourself, not only memorize it, but you need to speak the word. My friend, Pastor David Patterson says like this, it's not a sword until you speak. This does not become a sword until you believe and you speak it out. It didn't become a sword for Jesus until he spoke it out. And we need to learn to speak out the word of God in our lives. When you have the word of God inside of you, when you familiarize yourself, when you meditate on it, when you memorize it, and when an enemy comes in with a specific attack over you, you know where exactly the scriptures are. I don't know whatever situation you might be facing today. I want you to know there is always a scripture that you can look up to. Get a rhema. Get a rhema. If it is fear, Bible says, fear not. For I am, that's a specific word for that situation. Fear of losing a loved one. God says, I am there with you always. Yes. Whatever situation, my friends, if you know this, there is always a specific scripture that you can use. It's not a sword until you say it. The moment you say it, it becomes a sword. And you attack the enemy you see all the pieces of the armor are tied up to this look at every piece of armor the belt of truth truth is nothing but the word of God the breastplate of righteousness righteousness is from Christ that is the word of God right the shoes he's our stable he's he's our peace the shoes of peace he's the one who gives us peace okay the shield of faith he's our shield the helmet of salvation he is the one who brings salvation into he's the word of God everything that you see It's tied up with the word of God. That's why I said, if you know how to use this, then you will be successful with the rest of your armor too. So I want to challenge you today. I want you to look into your lives and say, answer this question. How is your sword today? How is your sword today? Is it rusty or is it sharp enough? Is it rusty? Is it sharp enough? I want the worship team to come as they're close with this one last scripture that I want to bring to your attention. 2 Samuel Chapter 23, 
verses 9 and 10. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 9 and 10. Talks, talks about a warrior. Okay, it says, Next to him was Eliezer, son of Dorai, the Ahohite. As one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pass Damim for battle. So it's talking about three mighty warriors that David had who fought against the Philistines, who taunted the Philistines. The next verse says like this. Then the Philistines, then the Israelites, sorry, then the Israelites retreated. But look at what, how, what Eliezer does. Eliezer stood his ground and stuck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. What does that mean? He fought so hard with his sword. After fighting, he couldn't separate his hand from the sword. So it became an extension of his arm. He stood his ground and fought until his hand was frozen to his sword. We need to be fully using the sword of the spirit until our hand are freezing onto this, until our hearts freezing onto it. It should become an extension of our lives. Eliezer stood his ground. When all the Israelites left, Eliezer stood his ground and fought. And the Lord gave him victory. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. God is looking for some Eliezer's today. He's looking for some Eliezer's today. He said, no way, devil. I'm not going to retreat. Even if my friends, my family retreat, I'm going to stand put until my hand is frozen to the sword. Becomes an extension of my hand. I just want to challenge you. How is your sword today? Can God find some Eliezer's today? Here? Can God find some Eliezer's today? Let's close our eyes. Let the Spirit of God speak to you. And before praying for everybody, I want to give anybody this opportunity to receive Jesus. You know, I'm talking about victory. The only way we can have victory is with Christ in our lives. And the only way we can receive Christ in our lives is when we accept Him into our lives as our Lord and Savior. The Bible says He took our punishment. Punishment that brought that was upon us. He took it upon Himself. He paid for our sins. Everything that we have committed wrong, He paid for it on the cross of Calvary. And He wants to give you life. So even as we all bow down, and if there is anybody in this congregation never received Jesus into their lives, I want to give you this opportunity. Maybe you received Jesus, but you never really followed Him. You went in your own way, but this is a great moment. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. Doesn't matter what I said, the Holy Spirit can speak to you in spite of what I said. He's, he can work in your life. And He's speaking to you right now. It's time to come back to Him. So as every eye is closed, if there is anybody in this congregation who says, I want to receive Jesus, I want to give my love back to Jesus, can you please lift up your hands wherever you are? Just as, as a sign of surrender. Thank you, I see those hands. Just as a sign of, if there is anybody before I pray, just a sign of hands. Just you don't worry about anybody. Don't bother about who is watching you, who is not watching. This is between you and God. Just keep your hand up, lift it up. God is watching you today. And everybody who's lifted up their hand, I want you to pray this prayer out aloud. And all the congregation will join along with you today in helping you to pray this prayer. So if you have lifted your hand, just I want you to pray this prayer out aloud. Heavenly Father, come on everybody. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me on the cross of Calvary. Jesus, I believe that you paid for my sins and you shed your precious blood for the forgiveness of my sins. I believe it with all my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. 
Come live inside of me by the power of your Holy Spirit. Just keep your hands lifted up. Lord, I just pray for everybody who's making that decision for the very first time or anybody who's coming back to you today. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll bring a greater revelation and a greater understanding of your work in their lives, O oh God. And the devil will not rob their joy of salvation anyway. We seal them by your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Our ushers are going to give you a card for you to fill up. Just please fill out the card for us. We would love to help you out in this journey with Christ. Can we all stand up in, in the presence of God? And I just want to pray for everybody. I just ask that question. How is your sword today? Can God find some Eliezer's today in this place? If your sword has been rusty, it's time to say, God, I'm sorry. I haven't dusted. I haven't shined my sword. They help me to do it from this moment onwards. So everybody all across this place, lift up your hands as a sign of surrender. Holy Spirit, we just come to you today. Lord, we see the importance of making our swords sharper, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, for your word, which is alive and powerful, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Can be specific, Lord, in certain every situation in our lives, O oh God. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll help us to read the Bible, familiarize ourselves with the Bible, understand it, memorize it. Lord, meditate on it. And we'll be able to speak it against the attacks of the enemy. And I pray, Lord, when we do that, we know, Lord, that you already has given us victory and we will enforce our victory in our lives, oh God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that will help my people to do that, oh God. To be students of the word of God. To be diligent in understanding your word, familiarizing themselves with your word, oh God. With your word. And speaking it out in resisting the enemy. Thank you, Lord, for that. I pray a blessing on everybody who is here and who is everybody who is watching us online. I pray that your spirit would be with us throughout this week and help us to have a great week wielding your sword in our lives, oh God. Thank you, God, for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.